So, uh, so for whoever's joined us, I'm, I'm Paul Irving. I chair the Center for the Future of Aging at the Milken Institute. Uh, I serve as a scholar at the University of Southern California School of Gerontology, and I chair an organization <clears throat> very focused on uh, the potential of older adults to serve and interact with, with younger people called Encore.org. Uh, let me just very quickly go through just, just a couple of slides for some framing on, on the work that we do at the, at the Center for the Future of Aging, and then my objective in, in this session uh, for, for anybody who's joined is to really engage in conversation and to figure out what you're interested in, uh, want to talk about, and, um, and want to want to propose. So, uh, so our center uh, is, is based in, um, in Santa Monica, uh, California, but we also have offices in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in Singapore. Which is which is really one of the most interesting places in the world for people interested in 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 aging. This gives you just a sense of our our mission. Um, and I I, I won't read read through it, but it it gives you a sense. We're focused on healthy and productive and and purposeful aging. The recognition that uh, changing age demography will really change everything in the in the years to come. And of course, all of you just by way of context are I'm sure very well aware of the, of the shifting demography. Here's what the world looks like or looked like in, in 2020, the portion of the population 65 plus. Uh, and here is uh, what, what <coughs> Odessa uh, projects at, at 2060, a, a much, much older world. So as I often say to, say to people, uh, the, the adaptations in policy and in business and in education really need to reflect the fact that the world, our streets, our communities, our families will simply look much older in the, in the years to come, a product both of, of um, generally increasing longe longevity, obviously net of this past year with the pandemic uh, and, and dramatically uh, lower birth rates uh, really in, in many areas across the world. Uh, one of the things that we're really interested in at the at the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging is is uh, longevity, life expectancy disparities across communities uh, uh, in in our country, particularly um, the United States has a has a relatively shameful um, record in, in in this regard. And what we know is social determinants of health have a significant impact on not just the quality of one's life, but on the length, length of one's life. And, and as I often say, we talk a lot in our country about income inequality. We don't talk about longevity and inequality in many ways, the ultimate injustice. Uh, what, what could be more tragic than, than having fewer years? And just by way of a couple examples in, in the US, zip code to zip code in, in cities in, in my country, uh, you can see that people uh, often, oftentimes live on average 20 to 30 years uh, difference depending on where, where they live. And that's a product, as we know, again, of a whole range of, of things, uh, opportunity and safety and health access and, um, and nutrition and, and, and education and, and, and so many other factors uh, in this complex mix that we call social determinants of health. Um, uh, one of the things that we're really interested in, obviously, is is the is the um, reduction in, in chronic disease and the management of, of chronic disease. And we know <clears throat> that uh, that of course um, the the COVID pandemic led to a recognition that chronic disease uh, not only is 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 uh, uh, a, a significant risk and something that. Uh, that must be must be addressed for its own reasons, but it also increases the risks of hospitalization and death from from viral disease. Uh, and and it, this just gives you a sense of some some U.S. Date, data. Uh, the the one that I think is probably particularly interesting, which is again reflective of a challenge that uh, exists across the world, is the costs of of um, dementia, particularly uh, Alzheimer's and, and other dementias. And oftentimes, I don't know if we have any health economists with us, but oftentimes uh, we we focus on, as as we should, um, uh, sp the specific care cost 
Um, and, and that's certainly significant in the United States, something, something in excess of a quarter trillion dollars uh, last year. But when we fully load the impacts of dementia on, on, um, on our economy, what we recognize is the loss of productivity of both disease sufferers and caregivers probably drives that num number even currently closer to, uh, to about a trillion bucks. So as we talk about the costs of disease, we not only have to think about this in medical terms, we must think about it in economic terms to make the case for increasing investment and urgency in, in tackling uh, these, these challenges. Just to, again, to give you, to give you a sense of, of kind of the, the risks uh, of smoking obesity and the sedentary lifestyle, all things that we, we know we need to address, not just in, in the US, but certainly around the world. And even in, um, in emerging economies and in, in, in developing countries, for example, in the global south, uh, where, where um, these kinds of, of issues, certainly smoking has been an issue for some time, but obesity and sedentary lifestyles are taking on some of the characteristics, uh, very sadly, of, of the global north with the, the same kinds of, of risks and the same kinds of, of health, out, health outcomes. So... Um, uh, we're very, very interested in, in issues and innovations to address social isolation and loneliness. We can talk about this, how it relates to the longevity economy and, and the potential for innovation in, in a minute, but you can just see some of the US data. Nearly, nearly a fourth of US adults, 65 plus, are, are socially isolated. We can see what the estimated Medicare costs are, 6.7 billion annually, and the risks of, of uh, disease and and uh, an earlier death. Ageism, I think you've heard this uh, potentially from others. I heard John Beard just a few minutes ago talking about the, the risks and costs of ageism. The WHO has recognized ageism as a public health menace. Uh, and it's something that's, that we simply need to address. It is, it is, in a sense, the ultimate paradox. It is um, uh, bias against one's future self. Uh, all of us will get older if we are if we are lucky, and it's remarkable that that uh, one of the outcomes of of the great miracle of science and extending longevity has has been this uh, this uh, youth youth focused uh, negative negative age bias that uh, is not only uh, unproductive. Uh, negatively affects people across the age spectrum, but but uh, has very significant health costs. Um, uh, just uh, an interesting kind of data point, something something we're interested in, just in, in in the U.S. to give you an example. And this is, I think, is is one of the great business opportunities. Um, AARP in the in the United States estimates that something in the range of eighty to ninety percent of older adults want to age in their homes, age, age in place, but only 1% of US homes offer the five most basic universal design fe features. And you can see the, the number on, on disabled older adults. So what this suggests is that the entire US housing stock is just horribly unprepared for the realities of population aging. And what that means is new ways to think about home design, home renovation, uh, ways to prepare this, uh, this, this housing for the reality of future demography, I think presents a really exciting business opportunity for inno innovators and, and frankly, policymakers to think through. Um, we're excited about the, the potential for, for purpose to uh, increase healthy longevity. And this is some data from uh, from Becca Levy at Yale, you probably have seen this, this data point if you're interested in the world of aging, but uh, Becca's research found uh, she controlled in, in the way she controls that people with positive self-perceptions of aging live on average 7.5 years longer. That's uh, as or more a significant uh, variable than body mass index smoking or, or exercise. Uh, you can see this, the second data point, I think this is from Rush Medical Center in Chicago, 2.4 times more likely to remain free of Alzheimer's disease uh, and, and uh, improved um, 
uh, outcomes on, in, in cardiovascular disease, et, et, et cetera. So this notion of, of purposeful aging, we think is, is really important. And oftentimes that's manifested through uh, continuing work and particularly through uh, volunteering and intergenerational enga engagement. Uh, the, the, the power of connection with, with younger people is, is not just uh, a nice thing to do, it's a salve, and it's uh, important both for the beneficiaries of, of that volunteering and for the younger people and themselves. So just to, just to leave you with, with, uh, with something, uh, uh, at my age, I'm, I'm uh, 69, pushing, pushing 70. So well, I remember uh, Jack Kennedy extremely well, uh, our, our president at, at a happier and more positive time, I think, in the United States in many ways, a more forward-looking time. But even then, when our population was much younger, Kennedy said it is not enough for a great nation merely to, have new, merely to add new years to life. Our objective must be to add new life to those years. I think that's the challenge and, and responsibility for all of us. This is just an example of some reports that we do. You can go to our website and read any of them, uh, work on, on dementia, on the economy, and on, and on purpose. And with that, I will uh, try to stop uh, sharing and, and, and much more important, hear from all of you if I can figure out a way now to get out of this. So... Let's see, how do I pause share? I'm not doing a very good job, am I? It just, there we go. Okay, good. Um, so I see everybody's got, got uh, cameras, cameras off. Who's gonna be brave enough to turn their camera on and engage in, in conversation? By the way, uh, in my prior life, I actually taught law school, so I got very used to, to cold calling, um, and I'd, I'd be happy to engage in that. Now, there we go. Okay, now I see some faces. Welcome. How are all of you? Hi, Emma. Uh, good to see you. So I see Will, I see Kim, I see Lillian, I see a picture of, 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 of Peter. So, uh, so, and I see here at Nancy, Nancy, here's, here's Peter live, and uh, Rita and Martin, I guess, are... are still off screen and, and Julietta, but, uh, but welcome to all of you. Um, so um, tell me a little bit yourself, who, who, who wants to start? Let me, let me just start kind of at the top of the screen. Will, where, where, uh, are, you, where are you from and what do you do? Okay, uh, I'm the associate professor at uh, Singapore Management University. Uh, and uh, yeah, so also a uh, deputy director of, uh, we have a research on successful aging here. Um, and I was very interested in, um, you know, um, what you were saying about intergenerational, um, you know, interactions and, and the, the benefits of that. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak on in any programs or any approaches that, that you're aware of um, that try to forge, um, you know, this kind of um, uh, interaction between, you know, like older and younger generations. Uh, yeah, well, well, uh, we'll, I oftentimes use Singapore as an example, as you could probably imagine, because because the government in Singapore is not only smart in many ways, smarter smarter than than my own government, but 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 Singapore uh, thinks, as you know, in very advanced ways about about ways to keep its its aging population healthy and engaged. And uh, I, I have to say, my last international trip, uh, as as the as the um, pandemic was, was, was upon us, was to Singapore. And one of the things that I did on that trip was visited a very interesting kampong uh, um, that, that uh, included not only, not only a really interesting hawker market and various other, other things, but an intergenerational com component. So I, th I think the, the point is we have to think about this not just as something that's a nice thing to do, but a necessary thing, thing to do. And it's important for a variety of reasons. It's certainly important for health. I would also say, and again, just witness what's happening in, in, in the US. And this is certainly, I think, true in some other places, I think somewhat less true in, in certainly in Singapore, but this notion of ageism, by the way, ageism uh, relating to both young and old, right? We, we have older people, we oftentimes have stereotypes. We make hear jokes about the millennial generation and and Gen, and Gen Z and 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 during very sadly in many ways during 
during COVID, we heard memes of uh, okay boomer, boomer remover. We had uh, we had a, a, a health advisor to the prior administration in the United States. I'll try to avoid politics who was actually, a, I think, probably, as some of you know, advocating select, selective um, isol isolation, a really ageist no notion. So the only way we're going to create understanding among generations is to, is to mix them up. Uh, the, the living model in the United States has tend to be age segregation. I actually just wrote a piece that was published yesterday. I haven't gotten death threats yet, but I expect I will. Uh, on comparing the aspirations that I have at my age versus those who have moved to the fastest growing metro in the United States in 2020, which was uh, uh, a development called The Villages in, in Florida. Uh, really quite remarkable. It is this kind of playground for older adults, uh, age, age isolated, uh, fundamentally racially uh, uniform. It's, it's, it's old, it's white, it's conservative. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and there is not intergenerational, intergenerational connection. I've been an advocate for, uh, for the kinds of developments, the kinds of, of innovations that connect older, older people in living environments, very much in learning environments. I mean, Will, I know it at not just NTU, but at NUS and other places in Singapore, there are conversations about how to integrate older, older and younger students. Uh, so I think this it's incumbent on all of us. I mean, if we want to have if we want to have intergenerational understanding, if we want to function well together, if we want young people to recognize not just the challenges but the opportunities of 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 um, this this shifting age demography, then we have to live together and work together and operate. You probably also know, and then I'll then I'll stop that there is there's an emerging body of evidence. Uh, my my colleague and friend. Laura Carstensen, who runs the Stanford Longevity Center, has, has written about it substantially that, that suggests that intergenerational teams, this is in, in business environments, outperform same age teams of any age. So uh, when I'm uh, up, up in the Silicon Valley <clears throat> talking to leaders and, and, uh, and we talk about kind of the most effective, the most competitive way to run their, run their businesses, I say, you know, rather than putting two you know, uh, very smart young Stanford PhDs on a project or two aging folks with, with experience and judgment like, like me on the, on, on the project, uh, take one of each and you get the risk-taking characteristics, creativity, innovative thinking of youth, and you get the experience and understanding how to navigate environments and understanding the world of corporate politics and all the rest, the wisdom and judgment that only comes with, with age and experience and, the, and the, the combination is powerful. And I think that's something that all of us have to advocate in all of our institutions. So thanks, thanks for the question, Bill. And, and, and again, I miss being in, in, in Singapore. It's quite a place. Well, thank, yeah, thanks for your response. And uh, I thought it was very interesting what you were saying about ageism being a two-way uh, issue. And that does seem to be an important target uh, if we want to you know, improve intergenerational connections. So thank you, thank you for your response. Absolutely. Who else? I, I, I can just call. Kim, you're, you're next on my screen anyway, so let me, yeah. let me go to you, Kim. Um, my name is Kim Amashizo. I'm with the Japan Center for International Exchange based in New York. Um, and actually, I've worked well, with some of your colleagues. Uh, Rajiv spoke at our uh, webinar mm -hmm. earlier this year on um, dementia-friendly community building in Asia. So I'm overseeing the uh, program on healthy aging in Asia that we have. Um, and actually, Will, I wanted to mention, we have a website that we run, which is the awin.org. It's A-H-W-I-N.org, which is under the auspices of the Japanese government's um, Asian Health and Wellness Initiative. And one of the features on that is innovative cases in community building, um, technology, and um, self-reliance, basically aging in place. And there are a number of initiatives there that you can look at, which are um, programs at the community level by NGOs, including HelpAge in Vietnam and IRL in Indonesia. 
um, that are promoting intergenerational um, work in their communities. So that might be a good resource to take a look at. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for that recommendation. Sure. And Paul, I'm really interested in that the housing challenges and whether there are some good cases and best practices in terms of promoting um, and helping older people renovate their homes. Is, are there, I don't know, in the U.S., we're never the best case. Sadly. <laughs> <But laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it really is ironic because these these days, you know, I, I don't spend if for if for reasons of the, the pandemic. Sadly, I don't spend as much time traveling around the world as as I used to. <laughs> but I used to kind of sadly hang my head at, at conferences <laughs> both in, in Europe and and kind of say do do what I say, not what we do. Uh, so, so so the reality is at at scale, Kim. I think the answer is no. Um, uh, now this is this is I think an increasing topic, and again, I, I my theory about these kinds of sessions is always call to action. So, let me ask all of you if you have influence or connections in schools of architecture, in in uh, in design societies, and, and all the rest to to raise the, these things. It's be, it's I would say just beginning, and as it is with so many other things that are focused on longevity and aging. Yes, we are making progress, but way too slowly for, for the realities of, of, the, of the demographic shift. You know, I, I look around the country at new home developments, still routinely uh, two, two floors and some, sometimes three floors, not elevators, uh, uh, <clears throat> age unfriendly in terms of level floors, grab bars, not, I mean, very basic stuff, right? Grab bars, not in, not in, in, in the bathrooms and, and all the, and all the rest counters designed in ways that a wheelchair can't navigate. As I often say to people, look, this is not about ignoring young people to the contrary, a, a door that's, that's uh, wide enough for a 25 year old can't always fit a, fit a wheelchair, but a door that's wide enough for a wheelchair can always fit a 25 year old. So, so the, the, the operating assumption that somehow designing for an older demographic is negative for, for younger people or does, isn't responsive to their need just isn't, isn't true. Yeah, I think Nancy just added in the stroller. I, I, I used to tell, I've actually unbelievably got a, got a 96 year old mom who's still alive now, now, now in a hospice, but when she was a little healthier, uh, a few years ago, and was was uh, was living in a in a, in a living place that uh, that I visit her regularly. By the way, we try to get young young people in to visit the old people to give them some joy. But we were out in front of her building. I just tell the story, and she was uh, walking very slowly. I'm kind of holding my arms up so you can imagine it with with an old bent aluminum walker. All all of you can envision an old aluminum bent walker and and uh, as we are walking very slowly you know down the street from from her building this incredibly attractive young couple walked by us you know dressed dressed to, to the nines with a baby carriage and as i've described it to people the baby carriage i won't use the word <laughs> as a word i it looked like a Ferrari. It was the most gorgeous thing I had ever seen. And, you know, it, it was titanium. It had swooping lines. It was the most beautiful thing I ever thought. And my, my, and of course, you know, look, I teach in a school of gerontology. I run a, I run a, an age an aging center. So you can imagine my, my reflex, my, my reaction was what idiot. I mean, I, this is unfair, but I, what idiot spent all the time designing that? Don't they recognize that the kids are now having babies well below replacement rate? You know that across much of the world. And when, when even we project out uh, to, to the global south, we know the same, the same kinds of, of, uh, of, of characteristics will, will exist. But nobody has spent time designing that same beautiful device for for an old, for an older adult. So it, it it speaks not only to need, but it speaks to the potential for products and services and innovations that uh, that not only can change lives, but frankly can elevate economies. And and it's something we talk about all the all the time. But kind of back to your back to your question, Kim, about about housing housing innovation. We are 
you know, thinking that baseball analogies, I apologize. I apologize. It's kind of the only thing I can do. Nine innings in a, in, in a baseball game, we're probably in inning five in, in shifting demography, but we're barely in inning one when it comes to responding to, to it. So it's, it's a, look, it's, it's a great challenge, but it's also a fa- for those of you who teach, you know, Will, you, 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 you teach at, at NTU, uh, the opportunity for young people, this is one of the things that I do when I run around to our school of engineering or, or other places, the opportunity for young people to become involved in aging in an exciting, positive way, to think about this as something that represents career opportunity, I just think is, is fantastic. So all of us who do this for a living, I think, uh, have a responsibility and an opportunity to make the case that, that yes, there are challenges. We can't, we can't sugarcoat, uh, you know, um, death rates remain consistent at a, at a hundred percent aging, aging is, is, is the most, uh, you know, uh, real factor in, in the onset of chronic disease and, and the like, but it's also a fantastic op- opportunity for I- innovation. And I hope, I hope we'll move more quickly on that. Who's, who's got, let's see, uh, on my screen, let's go, Lillian, you're, you were, the, I, you're, you're on mute, but you were, uh, you're next. So hello, where are you, where are you from? And tell me about uh, I am based in the Boston area with the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. Okay. And uh, with the nutrition department, I'm a senior uh, lecturer there. Uh, my areas of work focus on nutrition communication, lifestyle intervention studies, and I and also mindfulness. So it's quite kind of over a board in many things, but it's really, um, really important for us to be addressing all the chronic diseases um, in terms of like uh, Dr. Eric Verdon had talked about, and we do have a real problem worldwide with the obesity epidemic. Yeah. Uh, which is not helping and it's really challenging, but uh, I'm learning so much uh, from this uh, really exciting uh, work, workshop, not only a conference and the innovations and everything. Um, I'm really delighted to uh, be with you. And I also have a Singapore connection because we ha- actually have a, website with the National University of Singapore. It's called the uh, Asian Diabetes Prevention Initiative. So we have three websites, the Nutrition Source, the Asian Diabetes Prevention Initiative, and the uh, Obesity uh, Prevention Source. So we, we have, uh, we've been trying to do that. And I'm now uh, looking at also the both the effects of mindfulness practice, how it could be positively affecting the elderly. Um, and uh, so there is a lot to do. I'm going to pause and let others <laughs> join in. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, and I'm glad you, you mentioned obesity. Back, back to the challenges in the United States. I often say that the two, the two worst exports from, um, from America are, are, are attitudes about older, older people, particularly to Asia and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Those are, those are the two things that we sent that are, that are the worst. And as you know, and as, our, as, as you would know as well, Will, uh, one of the real challenges that we see across the world was increasing prosperity in some respects, but also disparity. In, in, in other respects, is this uh, is this increasing prevalence of, of obesity, uh, type two diabetes, and all the other chronic conditions that that flow from it? And of course, we know the relationship, or at least the the apparent relationship between between obesity and and uh, and COVID risk. So um, again, you know, uh, and and Lily, and the only case I, I have a number of friends at at, at the Chan at the Chan School. Um, Include, including several health economists, and one of the one of the pitches I make to my friends involved in things like nu- nutrition and, and social in- intervention is 
is you have to figure out a way to make the economic case so that the, so that they they get it. It's all it's all about uh, both cost reduction on, on on the one hand and flourishing and economic economic vitality on on the other. Uh, all those things are are intuitive to me. There's there's some good evidence that we have out there, but we have to do a much better case to make the point that, for example. Uh, access to healthy food is again not just a nice thing to do, but there are real uh, economic consequences, both in terms of cost reduction and in terms of, of economic growth, uh, that that should drive policy change. So, so th thank you, Lillian. I think the farm bill needs to be changed in America for the subsidy is a really big challenge because that's where the big food is flourishing. And we need to change that scene. Thank goodness we have healthier, uh, you know, supermarkets now, and with a lot of farmers' market. But we are far from being able to attain the healthy goals for America. We, we still and, we still have, and affecting the whole world that way. We still have a significant problem problem of, of food deserts. If you haven't uh, visited since you're you're in Boston, in Boston, or, I assume you're in Boston or Cambridge, uh, drop by my friend uh, Doug Rouse, Daily Table. I know him. You know, okay, he's a. This is this is a, for, this is kind of kind of in, inside baseball for everybody. But D Doug was the the former president of Trader Joe's, and his yeah. name is. This, this thing focused on, on on healthy food alternatives in places where where moms are otherwise forced to shop at liquor so stores and quick serve restaurants and and those kinds of places for for their kids. So so if you drop by, D Doug's an old pal of mine. Uh, it's it's a wonderful. He's day. wonderful. Yeah, say say hello to him. Uh, Nancy, you're I I you you are next up on my screen. Peter, I'm coming to you. I saw you I saw your hand up, but Hi. Nancy, you're up. Hi, Paul. Um, thank you for uh, for this this uh, opportunity today. Uh, my, I'm Nancy Wexler. I am a program officer with the Tony Hartford Foundation, um, where we have close relationships with, with your organization and many others, and we are helping to support this healthy longevity um, competition, the, the, this specifically. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with the, the National Academy team, and um, I, I just find it, there's just, there's so I love that we have this international presence and that we're learning and 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 have so much to to share. I think about um, what we do, which is to improve the care for older adults. Um, very much focused on care and evidence-based care, but so much of that has to do with where people live, how people interact. And one of my favorite awardees from the U.S. Catalyst winners was um, was an intergenerational program um, to think about providing some support post high school and even post college to young people to to serve as caregivers and um, you know get the experience and open open connections minds empathy and um, and really gaining the the perspective of what it means to be a caregiver I think it will do um, so many things um, and then offering some financial support for for those young people to then advance their careers or study. I think we really need more service oriented. I, we could do so much. I think yes. about economy with, with post high school service, but I, I really love that sort of low tech idea and then high tech ways of, of, of scaling those kinds of programs too in education. And um, so I've heard some of those high tech things at this conference today, but also thinking about just the simple human connection innovations that, that should be obvious. Um, one other thing we, we sponsored last year on, on PBS, if anyone thought it was called Fast Forward, a short documentary taking um, middle-aged people through the, the physical um, transformation to become as old as their parents and taking their parents into an aging. So, so it really uh, was an empathy, but also preparation exercise. And, and I recommend it if you haven't seen it, fast forward on PBS. But anyway, thank you so much for those discussions and the, and the real focus on the thinking about intergenerational. And Nancy, on, on that last point, if, you, if you've never been to, to um... Uh, Joe Coughlin's Age Lab at, at MIT. I, I, I commend it because he will he will uh, put on the foggy glasses and the and the kind of awkward stuff. And the the objective is to have you have you feel like you like you'll feel 
uh, in, in decades ahead. And obviously, That's we, right. I have not, my colleagues have, but I have not had the opportunity. And hopefully when we when we are back to traveling, I will. But thank you for that point. And yeah, it's excellent. It's excellent. And if you if you want me to hook you up with him, I'd be I'd be happy happy to. And we the the John Hartford Foundation for for all of you who, who don't know has been a fantastic leader in a whole range of areas, age friendly health systems and and like. And we Nancy, we appreciate your work and your support and Terry Fulmer's leadership in so many ways. Leave it to a nurse. I'll leave it to a nurse. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and 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 likewise, and we're very grateful. So, for so uh, yeah, it's um, you know again we're 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 all in many ways pioneers in in, in something that is going to change uh, the world in many ways. I often say that population aging. Sometimes people look look at me crosswise. I say it, it is the greatest challenge of the twenty first century, century uh, other than climate change. Uh, and, um, and, and yet in many ways, unlike climate change, which, which, uh, very, very sadly at, at, the, at this point may be more, a, more, a, a case for mitigation of, of, of risk. Uh, if, if any of you saw the report that just came out that basically said the next 30 years are baked, baked in, there's basically nothing we can do. We can only try to make lives better for future generations. We could, we can improve lives for older adults today. And we can improve, certainly improve, uh, older age for young pe young people tomorrow if we just change some policies and practices. But we we still have to have a case to make. Uh, Peter, you are on mute. There you go. <clears throat> Tell us about you. Hello, everybody. I'm going to introduce myself by just resonating with everything you've said. So I'm an intergenerative designer. I'm a physician that works on dementia, the author of The Myth of Alzheimer's and now Brain Health, uh, American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society, a plug. Um, I work in the nursing school, even though I'm a physician. Um, and I uh, actually have been using, Paul, the word climate crisis for the last few months uh, rather than climate change. I think sure. the last IPCC report uh, ha has just shown that and Extinction Rebellion and Sunrise, all the things that the young people are doing in this space are so important. Yeah. Uh, every time I'm with a bunch of stale gerontologists, I say, could you not tell me the fact that our generation screwed the planet for the next generations to follow is not an example of ageism? <laughs> to make your point that, uh, you know, ageism is not just uh, the province of, of, of the elderly. Um, and um, I'm the found, I founded with my wife three intergenerational public schools in Cleveland, uh, where elders, including patients with dementia, go to school with kids. And now um, I'll end up with this uh, comment. Um, the president of Interha, uh, the, the founder of Intergenerational Schools International, and working, and this is the organization I'm going to recommend to you, in Interhub as part of the GAIA project, Global Activation of Intention and Action, of the Presencing Institute, coming out, coming out of the MIT uh, 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 Center for Organizational Learning. Folks, in my opinion, it's all about transforming civilization. Um, th 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 this, we, need to, we need to get out of this Western enlightenment, rationality, modern er modernity. We need to re-enlighten, re-enchant rather, or re-enlight. Uh, uh, at a very broad level and the work that you're all doing and the focal points on intergenerational and environments and transdisciplinary are a way to do all this. And I really thank Paul for convening this space and allowing me to feel with a, uh, amongst a bunch of friends, some of whom I recognize, but I uh, wouldn't consider you all friends yet, but maybe you'll become. So thank you, Paul. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of us, if, if we simply did what our mothers told, told us to, to do, we'd, we'd probably be living better lives and, and ensuring better lives for, for others. It's, uh, look, I don't know whether all of you think of yourselves this, this way, but I would certainly commend thinking of yourselves this way. And that is, that is part of a movement. You, you just, you can't think of yourselves as being in a, in a domain or a field uh, as 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 Peter suggests, we have a lot of a lot of work to do and a lot of change to make, and that means we have to get out of our silos. Something that I work on doing all all the time. Uh, all of you know the definition of insanity: doing the same thing over and over again and, ex and expecting expecting a, diff a different result. So the things that we know that haven't worked really demand new new ways of, of thinking, and we have to do this not just with people, certainly. I'm speaking now to Pete, to Peter and I, 
our our ages, but we but we have to we have to do this with with young people as well. So I think uh, Jen, you were next, and, and you're still on mute. There, you, there you go. Jen, tell us about you. Um, my name is Jen Nodal, and I am a nurse practitioner. Um, I have a history in gerontology and hospice care. Um, I am. My program is about help empowering people to advocate for themselves um, because advocating for themselves primarily in healthcare, but there's been a lot shown that if they learn to advocate for themselves in healthcare, then that carries over to the rest of their lives. And so the goal of course being that they feel empowered and um, therefore they speak up for themselves and feel less, you know, they, they age slower because of that. Um, people who feel that they have control over their lives tend not to um, feel like they're kind of being pushed along. I see a lot of people who's, um, when I was working, they'd be saying to me, you know, look, before their kids would get there, they'd be telling me, this is what I want to do. But, you know, my daughter wants me to go on this medication or go on that medication or, you know, there'd be different goals that they would want to do, or, you know, they'd be going into assisted living and they really want to live at their home and they'd be capable of living at home. Um, sorry, my video skips. Can people hear me when my video skips? We, we, we hear you. Okay. Yeah. So that was a big, that's the big, um, purpose behind what I do. Um, there's been other projects that I've talked to a lot of people about, which is this intergenerational um, idea behind it. A lot of it, um, and I know we're running out of time, but the crux of these kind of projects that are kind of this bigger picture for me are these um, communities that I've talked to people about that are like these over 55 communities. And I've talked to them about the idea of that, you know, isolating themselves to just these over 55 is missing a big piece that if they would really work with um, these younger groups, that maybe that would actually help them rather than just isolating themselves to um, these communities where they are focused on aging basically. <laughs> and, you know, so um, one of the ideas that I'd had was having these people who are starting to age possibly starting to have some cognitive impairments and potentially bringing in really a lot of the foster children who um, are having their own problems. You know, they're, they're having their own challenges and creating housing where these are communities where there's both. And, you know, they're having gardens, you know, where their their purposes, you know, and yeah. rather than just um, intergenerational caregiving, more that there's, these people who are growing up side by side, um, the children growing up side by side with people who have a purpose then. Um, so it's a little bit different in the sense that they're looking up to these elders rather than just caregiving for these elders, yeah. um, which is a thing that I think is very, um, it's different because I think one of the things that we're losing is this respect for this older generation. I think that's one of the big challenges that we're, that we're losing in these younger generations more and more. So that's kind of- So uh, uh, Jen, if, if you're not aware of the work of, uh, uh, again, Encore.org that, that, that I share the board of, I would really strongly encourage you to go on the, on the website and, and, and take a look. So we talk a lot about co-generation, co very, very much to your point about, about one generation not caring for the other or not serving the other, but about older and younger people working together. By the way, if you're interested, literally yesterday, I, I referenced this piece. I, I don't have it to then have the link to share, but if you look up Paul Irving, Next Avenue, the villages, you'll see you'll see the article that uh, that I published yesterday, which Jen is completely apropos your your point. And I talk about, for example, communities like Bridge Meadows in, in, in Oregon that you, that you may know about. So there, there are now, and by the way, Peter, there's a wonderful, and you'll know the name of it, and I don't recall the name of it, I wish I did, a wonderful program in Cleveland. Uh, it's at a music school. Do you know the one I'm talking about where, where old and young live, live together and they serve each other and they perform together and it's... Yeah, I, I do, Paul. Um, 
it's a Judson Smart Living, a uh, retirement community, and it's affiliation with the Cleveland Museum of uh, yeah. Institute of Music. And yeah. by the way, they're they're both partners with our three intergenerational schools, so we're we're being intergenerative in Cleveland. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic program. And there's they're they're wonderful, by the way, videos about about Judson Manor. So so I would I would commend everyone to take to take a look at it. So. You look, you're absolutely right. This is not just, uh, again, as my friend uh, Trent Stamp, who, who runs the Eisner Foundation, says, not just nice, but, but necessary. These are, these are things that are good for, for all, all generations, and they're good for the broader society, and we need to. There are reasons why we have ended up in age segregation, some of them well-intended, K-12 education, which didn't exist you know, a couple hundred years ago, right? Uh, Peter, Peter's made made the point about kind of reverting to to the natural state of things, and and the point is is that some of the things, even well intended things that that have driven us apart, need to need to be dressed up to pull us together. And particularly, I think in light of some of the divisions that we experience now, uh, that that thankfully don't exist in as dramatic a fashion in in Asia, but certainly certainly in the U.S. And uh, and sadly, in in many parts of, of the EU as as well. So so Jen, thank thank you for the, for that comment. I know we're coming to the end. Uh, Jenny, how are we doing on on time? We are at the end of time. Oh. Um, but if you want a couple minutes to wrap up, we don't have a hard stop for this this session. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, look, my 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 pitch to all of you. I've got to make a pitch, right? So, so, so my since I'm not selling anything, my 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 pitch to all all of you is is uh, think of yourselves as being being part of a movement. Lillian, when you're when you're talking to your friends at at, at the Chan School again, I've got many many friends. Tell them that they've got to get out of the building, right? We we need uh, we need ac- academics. Uh, not just not just authoring pure peer reviewed papers. We need them speaking in retail environments, and we need to think about, about um, translating, you know, we think about translational science as moving from lab, lab to bedside. I often t- think about translating know-how from uh, ivy covered walls to, to places where policymakers, media leaders, uh, community leaders, et cetera, actually live, live and operate. So that's, it's very much my, my focus. You know, I operate in two worlds. I operate in an academic world and in a, in a real world. And often, oftentimes those two, those two worlds don't, don't, in it, don't interact. Um, look, I appreciate all of you, all of you being with us. This, this is a, this is an incredible time. We, we are, as you all know, in, in the decade of healthy aging, uh, the, the UN and WHO initi- initiative, uh, the National Academy of Medicine. Jenny, as is, is, you know, I think I, I serve on the National Academy of Medicine um, uh, Commission on, on Healthy Longevity, and we hope to have our report out at least within, within the next several months. We, we got delayed a bit by, by, by COVID, but we're optimistic that we're, we're making progress. Uh, and, um, and, and it's just, it's a very interesting time in, in this space. So all of us, uh, I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to uh, promote uh, and, and create and encourage innovation. And, and I appreciate all of you being here. And, and Rita and Julietta, even though we didn't see your, your faces, we see, we see your, your names in boxes. And so hopefully you're, you're hearing too and, and you've gotten something from this session as well. So everybody, thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great uh, rest Thank of the, you. the summit. Bye-bye.